The next witness is Mr Giles Boddy, Commissioner. Yes. Is Mr Boddy in the hearing room or waiting outside? Commissioner, we're waiting for Mr Boddy. Helps to have a witness, Ms Diaz. It does, I agree. Mr Boddy, do come in to the witness box, would you? <coughs> Mr Boddy, uh, can I ask you whether you'd prefer to take an oath or would you prefer to take an affirmation? Affirmation, thank you. Yep. Yes, affirm the witness, please. I solemnly and sincerely... I solemnly and sincerely... Declare and affirm... Declare and affirm... That the evidence I shall give... That the evidence that I shall give... Will be the truth... The truth... The whole truth... The whole truth... And nothing but the truth... And nothing but the truth. Thank you very much, Mr Boddy. Do sit down. Ms Diaz. Mr Boddy, can you please state your name and occupation and your address? Uh, Giles Edward Boddy, 225 George Street, Sydney, and I'm the CFO of Aussie. You have been issued with a summons to appear today? Yes, I have. Do you have that summons with you? Yes. I tender the summons, Commissioner. Uh, exhibit 1.72, summons to Giles Edward Boddy. Yes. And you have sworn a witness statement dated 5th of March 2018? Yes. Do you have the original of that signed statement with you today? Yes. I tender the witness statement, Commissioner. Uh, exhibit 1.73, witness statement, Charles Edward Boddy, 5 March 2018. I see a copy of that has been brought up onto the screen. It is AHL.0008.0020.0053. for the transcript. And you have mentioned that you are CFO of AHL Investments Proprietary Limited, that is otherwise known as Aussie. That's right, Correct? and I started uh, with them in February 2016, so two years as the CFO. You are a trained accountant? Yes, that's correct. You're actually employed by CBA, is that right? Uh, when I first started two years ago, it was, uh, Aussie was not a wholly owned subsidiary at that stage, so that was the arrangement with my contract. But now it's a wholly owned subsidiary, so it's, it's all one group. You've mentioned in your statement that you're on secondment. Is that still the case? That is the case. And when will that secondment end? Uh, it's indefinite. Prior to being Aussie CFO, you were CFO of Corporate Financial Services, Local Business Banking and Regional and Agribusiness Banking at CBA. Is that correct? And before that, Financial Controller of Wealth Management. Is that correct? Uh, it was Comsec before Comsec? that, sorry. So all up, you've been employed by CBA for approximately 10 years. That's correct. And you're also currently a director of Aussie and its subsidiaries? That's correct. When were you appointed a director, Mr Boddy? Uh, I think it was March 2016. Yes. And in your role as a director and CFO, you have direct reports on a number of areas, risk that's, and compliance? That's correct. In my role as CFO, I, I look after a number of support areas. I look after finance, I look after risk and compliance, uh, the legal customer dispute team, and then also the broker support services area. And regulatory issues? It, with the risk and compliance team and also in the legal team. And you mentioned broker governance, that broker oversight as well, and any issues arising in that regard? Sorry, in the statement I mentioned just then? I didn't mention uh, broker just governance? Then, yes, and in your statement, broker no, oversight. I mentioned that... broker support services. Support. That is a support line for the brokers. So when the brokers are processing applications in Aussie systems and they have a problem, a password reset or a, a system issue and a verification or a validation issue, they'll contact that support team and get advice on how to move forward. I see. And you attend board meetings? Yes. You read board papers? That's correct. Risk and audit papers? Yes, I do. In paragraph seven of your statement, you refer to enhancements to Aussie's risk management framework in 2016. Yes. Can you describe what those enhancements were? Uh, so I don't know if you have the document there, but some, some of the enhancements were sales conduct risk, adding that to the risk management framework. So we've got a number of risks within Aussie, so operational risks, uh, credit risk as well, but adding sales uh, conduct risk, and then talking about how that was going to be approached. There was a refresh of the risk management framework, the risk appetite statement, 
We also formalised the risk and control self-assessments, which have been rolled out across the business throughout 2016 and 2017, uh, in the process of doing standard operating procedures, how we're going to capture reportable incidents, how we're going to report on them up to executive risk committees and up to the board. And why that time? Why 2016, Mr Boddy? Uh, we review it every year and we refresh the document and enhance our risk management processes every year. So it's taken place also in 2017 and will take place again this year? It gets tabled and we look at the document and so if there's enhancements required, then the document will be updated. And you also refer to customer excellence policy and enhancements to that policy? In your statement? Yes. So the customer excellence policy is a policy really focused on making sure brokers are putting their customers, our customers, Aussie's customers, at the front of everything. So they're looking after their interest, all the NCCP requirements and RG209 in terms of responsible lending, that they're having reasonable conversations with their customers about their objectives and their requirements, that they're having reasonable conversations about their financial position and also reasonable conversations around or reasonable steps to verify uh, their financial information. And at some of your statement, you also say Aussie has a program of work to remediate issues in relation to broker misconduct. Yes. Which are identified in a particular audit report issued by the CBA Group Audit and Insurance dated 11 December 2017. Yes. You don't exhibit a copy of that audit report to your witness statement, do you, Mr Boddy? I don't. I believe it's been submitted. And by remediate in that paragraph, do you mean fix those broker misconduct issues? You do not mean remediate customers? Not remediate customers, no. Enhance the processes. So in terms of the 2017 audit, so there was a couple of areas that have been called out. So this is an audit by CBA's uh, Assurance and Governance team, which comes in. They've done two audits. They did one audit in 2015, January 2015. They did the second audit in December or July 17 through to December 17. Um, and they've identified a number of issues that we need to address. Uh, two of those issues are responsible lending uh, and, and improving our processes around responsible lending. The second one is around broker behaviour and governance and improving our processes around those. Those two issues were raised in the 17 audit issue. They weren't items raised in 2015, but they're definitely items raised in 2017. And we've got a program of work looking at what we can do to improve our processes around monitoring broker behaviour. We've got processes in place to detect fraud, to detect broker issues uh, and conduct issues, but how do we enhance them and use smarts of our information and data analytics to pick up trends? Well, I'll take you to the report, Mr Body. that might assist. So this is the December audit report that you mentioned. It's CBA.0506-0001.0014-2017. I'll wait for that to be brought up for you to look at. You can see at the top there, reference to internal audit, Aussie Home Loans FY18. Does that indicate that it's part of the financial year of 2018? Uh, I'm not sure why it says FY18. So the audit was conducted between July 17 and December 17. The period of information they were looking at was three to four years. They were going back and looking at it. I see. And you are the accountable executive noted there? Yes. Did you prepare this report, Mr Boddy? No, so CBA Group Assur Assurance and Audit prepared the report uh, and then I am the liaison person, so I'm the connection, the responsible manager working with the audit team during the audit. But you agree with what is said in the paper? You've read it? I've read the, that's an audit opinion and I've read the audit opinion and they've got some valid points there that we're taking on and we're doing remediation work. It's a bold CFO who says he doesn't agree with audit, isn't it, Mr Boddy? Yeah, so, can we take it that you agree with what audit have told you? Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. So we see in the top left-hand corner a box, report rating is the heading there. The first heading in the box is control environment. Do you see that, Mr Body? Yes. What does that term refer to? The control environment, so they are doing a, they give a rating of unsatisfactory, uh, marginal or satisfactory. Uh, in terms of the processes that they came in and ordered. So they look at a couple of processes or a number of processes uh, and then they give a rating depending on the risks that have been mitigated in those processes. So they look at the controls. If it's satisfactory, they'll say all the controls are in place, there's no further work required. Uh, marginal would mean that the controls are in place and there are some enhancements that can be made. Uh, unsatisfactory would mean with some of the issues or some of the processes we audited, 
we identified some issues, and those issues need immediate remediation. So, so it's the process that is deficient, is it? That's right. They're looking and, at the and process it, and they're it, identifying... Sorry. No, you go... They're on. identifying issues with the process. So they're saying we've identified some issues in that process and there's a probability that they'll default and have an issue uh, and you need to address those issues immediately. Not the whole end-to-end -end process, but parts of your process. So an unsatisfactory rating, a red rating like this, is... I was going to say a commentary on, that's the wrong expression, uh, is a conclusion reached about process and sufficiency of process. Is that right? That's right. Yes. Go on. Can I assist with that, Mr Body, by taking you to the final page <coughs> of that document, 0037? Yes. It contains a description of that criteria, or criterion. You can see there the... Oh, we haven't got it yet. In the box on the left down the bottom, unsatisfactory denotes controls are not appropriate for the risks being managed. There are significant number of issues that require immediate attention. Is that what you intended to summarise before I or extrapolate on? Well, what I mentioned before was that, that last sentence. So there are a significant number of issues which need immediate remediation. That's right. Yes. When they're reviewing the processes for controls. That's right. And the rating for, going back to the first page, sorry, uh, 0014. And the rating for a control environment there is unsatisfactory. That's right. So and that's the audit team weighing up all the items they reviewed and of the ones that they identified that had some issues there that need remediation immediately, overall they're giving a ra rating of unsatisfactory. And that it would was be a marginal, sorry, I was going to say, it would be a marginal if they said the controls are all in place and there's some opportunity for enhancements. Yes, but they did not give it that rating, did they? No. And that's also the rating that was given in 2015? Uh, that's correct. So in 2015, they identified from the processes they audited uh, some issues, uh, and there was a couple of high issues. They, they weren't the similar issues that are in this paper, so they weren't around responsible lending, they weren't around broker behaviour, they were around other items around supplier governance uh, and security of customer information on our IT systems. But they were also significant, a significant number of issues to warrant that unsatisfactory rating in 2015. They were significant issues, yes. And the next line, management awareness and actions. This one is rated marginal and, sorry to jump around, but the definition of marginal on the final page, 0037, is controls are operating but require improvement in the short term to ensure that all risks are being managed appropriately. And that too was marginal in 2015, or, Mr. Or are we into the management awareness criteria, Ms. Diaz? I think I'm a little confused. I thought we were into management awareness and actions rating criteria and that we were I apologise, Commissioner, you are right. The that, orange marginal there. That, that is correct. Yes. So management has shown some understanding of the risks and, and controls relevant to their business. However, they were not performing regular testing of controls and uh, were not fully aware of and taking action to resolve all material issues. Alternatively, management has limited cultural correct characteristics to manage risk effectively and or were not cooperative in the audit. Do you know anything about the details that might have resulted in that rating, Mr Body? Yes, so the rating for marginal for management awareness is about the perceived inaction or slow um, way in which we dealt with those issues that required immediate attention in 2015. So the timeliness of resolving those issues that were identified in the 2015 audit report. I see. And the overall report rating is red, which is the same as the report rating that was given in 2015. Yes, the overall rating is red. So when we talk about marginal management awareness, so the issue there was the uh, timeliness of completing those issues. Uh, if that had been done in a timely manner, then the management awareness would have been satisfactory and the overall score would have been amber, but the overall score is red. Yes, and it was in 2015 as well. I see. So it's fair to say that the risk profile of Aussie hasn't changed much in three years, is that correct? Uh, it's definitely changed. It's definitely improved, so I think you had the risk profile statement or the risk culture survey up a minute ago, and that was the 2016 
risk culture survey. The 2017 risk culture survey, which this audit team completed, showed a significant improvement in the risk culture in the last two years. We can come to that. Okay. Okay, so on that first page again, 0014, the, the first line under the audit conclusion is what you were describing before, is it? We, this is our first audit of Aussie Home Loans since 2015 Red Audit. Our work was delayed to allow Aussie to work through previous audit findings and the transfer of full ownership of the business and to CBA. And then further down, the last paragraph under that heading is the combination of an unsatisfactory control environment and marginal management awareness resulted in our red rating overall. Appendix D benchmarks our audit findings to other aggregators visited by group audit who would be rated similarly. Now there's another table on the left there with, under the title issue summary. And on the top row, can you describe Mr. Buddy, what, what those letters stand for, V-H-H-M? Uh, on the L. first table, so the first one is the issue summary for AHL rating. And so very high, high, medium, low. And so this is in respect of uh, the measure we would use is financial impact. So on Aussie's scale, uh, a high rating would be a financial impact of $650,000 to $2 million. So being a small, previously privately owned business, we have quite a very low benchmark in terms of financial impact. So a high is a $650,000 to $2 million impact. So these are financial impacts on the business, what the loss... What the potential is loss is potential of that loss. risk. If that control's not working, you're potentially going to have a failure and you might end up being at a high. On a high, it might cost the business $650,000. And there are 103 outstanding issues there. So in the 2017, there's 103 there. So what you can note is AHL management issues. So they're self-identified issues, 77 self-identified issues in 2017. In the 2015 audit, we had 11 self-identified issues. A risk culture that's developing is one that's looking at their processes, identifying issues and fixing those issues so that that increase from 11 to 77, you know, in partnership with the risk profile of the business lifting during that time as well is that the business is taking, you know, Aussie, we're focusing on our processes, we're identifying the risks and we're doing something about it. Well, how's that sit with the management awareness and actions rating of marginal? Uh, so, in the report, the Which second paragraph... You, you just let me preface it so that you can deal with it fully. It, it, as I understood the orange rating, it was that, in effect, management asked too slow picking up and dealing with these things. But uh, with that background, what's your answer? That, that is correct though. Uh, management were too slow. We were too slow to pick up and deal with these issues. Uh, the second paragraph of the audit report there, I think it's probably almost the second last sentence of that, talks about... Um, just check, sorry. sorry, it was the last sentence, notice that um, our risk culture work also noted improvement in risk management awareness, capability, accountability um, in the last assessment. So whilst there was untimeliness in the completion of the audit issues, the risk culture has been improving. It's coming through in the culture statement. We've got the risk and control self-assessments occurring. We're identifying issues and we're reporting those issues. And that's why there's a large number of 77 self-identified issues. It's not simply a risk culture question, is it, Mr. Body? There's more. There's more going wrong here. I'll take you to what is referred to as Appendix D, to, which is a reference to the table commencing at CBA 0506 0001 0035. This is the benchmarking of the audit findings <coughs> that's referred to on the first page. Now, do the letters across the top row they designate different mortgage? broker aggregators in the industry? Yes. With Aussie's at the end there. AHL, yes. How, how, do you, how does the risk committee have access to this sort of information? Where is it gathered from? I think the CBA group audit and assurance team have been looking at other aggregator groups. Uh, in terms of AHL or Aussie, they did a six month 
internal audit and had access to all information. Uh, with the other aggregator groups they've looked at there, I think they had a process of submitting requests to those aggregator groups to answer questions and submit some files back and they reviewed those and then compared and made an assessment. So a six month internal audit versus reviewing a number of files for each of the aggregator groups. And the art, there are a list on the left there, uh, aspects of the responsible lending compliance framework, which you would agree are necessary to ensure that the aggregator or, or Aussie complies with its legal obligations under the National Credit Act? Having a responsible lending or abiding by the responsible lending um, guidance, yes. Yes. You're familiar with the key provisions of the Act, Mr Body? Yes. Yes. You would know a broker has an obligation to perform a preliminary assessment as to whether a loan would be unsuitable for a person and they're required to make reasonable inquiries of the person's financial situation and their needs? Yes. We see a reference there to scope and approach of file reviews. And file reviews are an important part of an entity's control, <coughs> would you agree, to ensure that risks like fraud are monitored and detected early? Yes. And to ensure brokers are complying with their obligations under the National Credit Act? Yes. And you note here, the report says that Aussie's scope and approach to file reviews requires improvement. That was noted in the body of the audit report. They noted that we conduct file reviews. Uh, we conduct file reviews for over 3% of all applications that come through, uh, and that is the process that we use. It's a line two defence, and we also do file reviews in line one, but that picks up items of misconduct. It picks up items of fraud as well. But you mentioned 3%. That's only one per year per broker. Uh, no, 3%. We have 1,033 brokers. We would do over 2,000 file reviews. A year. Do you, you mean second or first line file reviews, Mr Body? Second line. So the compliance team, I haven't added in line one, which would be uh, the quality assurance people there, and as well as the retail business consultant and mobile business leaders also conduct reviews, but I haven't included those in those numbers. It's just line two. I see. Well, we'll come to a page in this document where it says that the selection process is manual and most brokers are subject to only one file review per year. I'll take you that actually. It's on 0015. Do you see there at the bottom of the sentence of the title monitoring and quality assurance over brokers is not robust? The selection I'll process. Read that. Yes. Sorry, I was reading the sentence where it yeah, just said most, yes. most brokers. So it's, a, it's an opinion that most brokers have one file review. So we do over 2,000 for 1,033 brokers. That's on average more than two. Uh, we no, have routine two. and targeted, sorry. Routine. One or two, Mr. Body, is that what you're saying to me? One or two file reviews? Over two, on average over two, but it's more than that for particular brokers. So we look across the broker community uh, and we do routine reviews and we do targeted reviews. Uh, in a number of situations, we'll drive in and do a targeted review and pull out a whole number, number of files and go into deep dive. Um, otherwise, we just do high-level reviews uh, that are conducted. Okay, well, we may as well finish reading that there. It says, the selection process for line two quality assurance file reviews is manual, and most brokers are subject to only one file review per year. This represents less than 3% of broker loans being captured for review. Results from reviews are not auto-collated to draw assumptions on broker behaviours, and no other mechanisms for bro monitoring brokers are available to AHL. Do you agree with that statement? The reviews are manual, uh, and the recommendation coming out of this report is really good in terms of the data analytics we can look, and you'll probably touch on that in a minute about broker behaviour, but what the manual, there's not an issue with the manual, it's just how do you do more. The manual file review, though, is pulling out files, pulling out supporting information, looking at the documents, uh, and validating those documents. So that's pay slips, it's gift certificates, it's all those things which are really hard to detect if they're real or false documents. But uh, there's no it's other a manual process, though, you're right. There's no other supporting mechanism for that other than what you referred to in your statement as the broker dashboard, which is still in a pilot phase. Is that right? Sorry, any more supporting information? Any for more <coughs> mechanisms? No other mechanisms, as said in the audit report? No other mechanisms for monitoring brokers? Uh, for monitoring brokers, it's the file reviews that are conducted. So there's... Yes. We met, we, we're talking about line two file reviews, sorry, but there's line one file reviews. And so the sales leaders, the uh, retail business consultants, the mobile business leaders, uh, 
where there's a franchisee, franchisees are conducting file reviews of the loan riders within their stores. So there's line one reviews that are happening as well, uh, but in line two, that's right. And further down, there's a bullet point that says that the broker dashboard, um, well, I'll, I'll read the preceding sentence. With the assistance of management, we developed a broker monitoring dashboard to flag suspicious broker behaviour. The dashboard highlighted 586 instances in the last 52 months where broker have submitted their own loans and are earning commissions on these loans. Management have agreed to communicate brokers that they no longer be able to submit their own loan applications via AHL. Does that still take place? That's correct. Uh, the process has been, uh, the brokers have been advised not to do that anymore. Uh, and that's the case in terms of writing their own loans. When was that changed, Mr Boddy? Uh, recently. I think it's been something that's been talked about for a while, but it was changed recently. I think it was probably January of this year. I see. You would agree that's not appropriate conduct for a broker to submit their own loan application and earn commission on that loan application? Y yes, uh, the process is they're processing their own home loan. So they're buying a house, processing their own home loan, they put it through a lender, uh, and then because they're a broker, they're getting a trail commission on that. So effectively They are pretending to be their own client, Mr Bodies. Do you agree with that? Sorry, they're pretending to be their own client? No, I wouldn't say that. I'd say they're just processing their own loan on their documentation. They're including their own information about their income, their expenses. They're doing their own declarations and they're submitting their own home like loan. Like some people would rather than going to a broker, they're submitting their own home loan with the lender and they're getting a trial commission for that. So do you advise lenders that the brokers are acting for themselves when they're submitting the, the loan? Do the lenders know this? We, I don't, I mean, Aussie doesn't advise the brokers, but the application form coming from the broker has the broker's details on there, their employment, what they do for a job, how they're earning their income. It's on their application form. I see. Also on that page, actually, it, it um, mentions that responsible lending obligations are not always met. There's a title there, you can see that. AHL do not have a policy or guideline that defines minimum expectation from a broker to verify customer information for a home loan application. This includes verification of income, liabilities, account history, savings and gifts. In all loan, 30 loan files sample tested, the brokers did not capture enough supporting documentation to substantiate that reasonable steps were taken to, the confer to confirm the product was not unsuitable. For 10 of these files, a quality assurance test has been performed, but this issue was not identified. For 13 out of 20 files tested, the broker had not retained evidence to support that reasonable steps had been taken to verify the customer's financial situation. For example, a customer needs analysis was not completed or signed by the customer. Now, Mr Body, I see the time. I, I will ask the Commissioner if perhaps you can answer the next question or we can take a break at the point. I ask you a question and... Yes. So the question is, Mr Body, you, you've referred to knowing about brokers' responsible lending obligations. Yes. And you would admit that that is a resulting breach of the responsible lending obligations. Do you agree with that? No. No, I don't agree with that. I can go through each item if you'd like. So I think maybe let's start with the last one, which is, for example, a needs analysis isn't complete. That's to, to sign a needs analysis is not a NCCP requirement. Uh, that is an Aussie requirement that they complete a needs analysis for the customers. They document the objectives of the customers, the financial position, uh, the assets, the liabilities, and they do this with every loan. And then they sit with the customer and go through that information. And then the customer signs it as a declaration that it's accurate. So that's, that's one of them. So the fact that it wasn't signed is an NCCP requirement. Aussie does it. It hasn't met our quality standards. So that's why that's a concern. And that's what we measure. In terms of the 30 loans and them not selecting the, the right product um, or that there wasn't documentation about the product selection, the challenge with this in terms of the audit. So those 30 files there, those 30 loans were all CBA loans. So. They're all CBA loans. The lens the audit was bringing to that was, was there appropriate documentation around the selection of the brand of the loan rather than the product? As in, is it an investor loan? Is it an owner-occupier loan? Is it an interest-only loan? So the lens was more, there's 30 files here. They're all being settled with CBA. Why did the broker choose CBA over ANZ or Westpac 
or another lender. That's not what the report says there, Mr Boddy. H how is it that you know that that's, those 30 loan file samples are all CBA? I was involved in the audit. I'm the responsible executive. I was involved in the audit. I wanted to see when they, uh, the audit team makes these recommendations, we go through what files they've reviewed, what the output of that review is, and that's their opinion, and that's fine. And that's an independent assurance team, and so we take that on face value. Uh, but I, I like to understand what's happened here and what the 30 files are, and if it's representative of the whole population of Aussie's applications. But the documents necessary to verify that the right decision has been made have not been retained in 13 out of 20 files. And you're aware that ASIC promulgates regulatory guidance on these sections in the Act. There is a guideline I will take you to if you would like to see it. Um, no, that's, no that's, that's, a, that's a valid point. Sorry. I suspect, Ms Diaz, we're about to uh, continue into... Uh, we, will, we are, Commissioner. I don't know whether they're deeper waters, broader waters or something, but it's one o'clock, 2 p.m. Yes, Ms. Diaz. <coughs> Mr. Body, before the break, we were looking at a group audit and assurance report from December. I'll call that report up onto the screen now. CBA, oh, there it is. And that paragraph there, uh, under the title, Responsible Lending Obligations Are Not Always Met. Do you remember we were discussing that and we were talking about um, the statement there that brokers did not capture enough supporting documentation to substantiate that reasonable steps were taken to confirm the product was not unsuitable. And the further statement in that paragraph, for 13 out of 20 files tested, the broker had not retained evidence to support that reasonable steps had been taken to verify the customer's financial situation. And I wanted to take you to a regulatory guide that ASIC promulgates about responsible lending obligations and that is RG209, and it's RCD 0021-0001-0088. That's the first page. If, if I could take you to the page 33, 0120. There's a heading there it says processes to ensure that a preliminary or final assessment is made. And it says there, as set out above, the National Credit Act requires credit licensees to assess via either a preliminary or final assessment whether a credit contract or consumer lease is not unsuitable for a consumer. In order to meet this obligation, we, ASIC, expect that you will be able to demonstrate that you have adequate processes in place to assess whether a consumer has the capacity to meet their payment obligations without substantial hardship, and whether the credit contract or consumer lease meets the consumer's requirements and objectives. If you do not have the appropriate processes in place, it will be difficult for you to show that you are meeting your responsible lending obligations. And there's a note there that refers to a case Note, in ASIC and the case of the cash store, TCS, in the absence of appropriate records in the customer file or clear processes for ensuring completion of assessments, Justice Davies found that the licensees had failed to comply with their obligations to make an assessment. And my question to you is that, having regard to the paragraph in the audit report, you would agree, wouldn't you, that Aussie's processes are unable to substantiate that the legislative requirements are being followed. Sorry, was that in relation to the 13 um, files and capturing documentation? Is Not that... only the, the 13 files, but the processes in place that are referred to in, in that report. But specifically those files, what, what is your first answer on the files, Mr on the, on the oh Yeah, on the 13 files, I think the point was, um, and I thought it related to that point as well, there wasn't sufficient documentation on the 13 files out of 20 files. Uh, that's a valid point. Uh, there wasn't sufficient documentation. Uh, this was a period of time from early 15 through. Um, 
what Aussie has done since then is put in place a new scanning system and it came in early 2017 to automatically pick up uh, customer information, the documents that brokers are collecting and recording it and keeping it electronically on, on record. Um, but prior to that, there are files that don't have sufficient documentation. Um, as well as in that in the 13 items, um, there's some information that you can't get certification for. So some, are, I think some of the cases were um, where people are verifying their assets and they're self-employed and they're running, they're a plumber or an electrician and they value the truck with the equipment in it. Um, there's not a way of documenting that and verifying that. They generally give you a valuation as to what the truck and the uh, equipment they have is worth. And so some of the items there couldn't be verified for documents, but there's ones that could and there wasn't documentation on record. And there should have been. The paragraph says that Aussie doesn't have a policy or guideline that defines minimum expectations to verify information. Now, that was the case in December. So you referred to some practices in early 2017. Did you mean early this year that things have changed? Oh, in terms of, a we do have a new policy as well, early this year, which talks about documentation and responsible lending. So we do have that prior to that policy coming in. Uh, we had policies and we have contractual arrangements with our brokers that they are to comply with NCCP requirements and uh, RG209. Well, I'm lost as to the chronology, I'm sorry. Mr Boddy, uh, you're assuming uh, I'm across a chronology in ways which I am not. One, does, uh, does AHL now have uh, a uh, uh, documented uh, set of uh, uh, policies uh, about responsible lending? Yes. When did it first get that documented uh, set of uh, uh, requirements? Uh, and that was coming out of that 2017 audit and that was put in place in early March. This year? year 2018. Yes. We can go back to the document. Just before we leave that, that is something that had been on the audit report since 2015, is it? No. It was, no? Only, it was only on the 2017 audit report, which was oh. finalised in December 17. No reference in the 2015 report uh, to... Uh, lack of controls uh, uh, to ensure responsible lending, is that the position? That's correct. And the fact is there were no uh, sufficient controls to ensure responsible lending in the period 15 to 17, were there? We have policies and the policies referred to the NCCP Act and particular regulatory guidance 209 and we have a contractual arrangements with the brokers to follow that regulatory guidance note, which is responsible lending and how to apply responsible lending. But it's a valid point about having a policy and that's why we're taking action to put a policy in place uh, and we've completed that. The audit that. report of 17 was that what was then in place was not satisfactory. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. And you brought it into play in March this year? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> we'll go back to the first page of the audit report, Mr Boddy. Something else, this is uh, 0014 of CBA 0506 0001 0014. Something else that the audit committee picked up on there is controls under the heading controls to confirm customer declared information is completely and accurately sent to lenders through next gen are not robust. Loan application information from toolbox automatically feeds through to lender through next gen's intermediary system called apply online AOL. Do you want to describe what toolbox is for the commission Mr Boddy? Toolbox is an Aussie proprietary system which is used by uh, Aussie brokers when they're completing or supporting a customer preparing a home loan application. So they'll get all the customer information and that's set out in terms of the NCCP guide, in terms of the objectives, they'll get the financial information, they'll verify the financial information and they put it into this system toolbox and it's a step-by-step -step process to ensure they capture all that information they're supposed to be capturing. For, um, to do their assessment of the loan and to submit the application. So they'll complete it in toolbox, all the information. Uh, once that's completed, they'll do a needs analysis uh, statement. They'll sign it with a the customer and on that they'll then submit 
that application, it'll go into a third party system, which is called Apply Online, which is a system that works between mortgage brokers and panel lenders. Uh, and then it feeds into the lender effectively and completes the application form for whichever lender it is. And where does supporting documentation get input into that process? Pay slips, employment letters, that's the like. Right, so that's a, so there's a new system, there was an old system, but in early 2017, a new system called Aussie DX was created and it's a, so the broker will capture all the information uh, and then they'll scan it into Aussie DX and it gets stored uh, and it also get exported through Apply Online to the, uh, to the lender and they'll also be able to submit hard copies to the lender. And that still takes place, but through yes. the toolbox? Yes, right? but I'm not the toolbox expert, but yes, that's I my see. understanding. And the paragraph goes on to say, we identified 8,471, of which 6,165 were settled, AHL applications over a four-year period where customers declared dependence may not have flowed correctly from toolbox to lenders' systems, lender systems through Apply Online. This could be due to a data mapping issue between toolbox and AOL, or due to multiple users having, including brokers and support teams, having access to manipulate customer information in AOL before sending to the lender. I'm reading over the page now on 0015. Perhaps those two pages can be put next to each other on the screen. And the paragraph goes on to say, concerns over data mapping between toolbox and AOL were raised in the previous audit. Is that true, Mr Boddy, that the concerns were raised in the previous audit? Yes. They're slightly different issues, but they were effectively around data between toolbox and apply online. And was it a similar issue in that data about dependence was not being captured? No, it wasn't. It was slightly different. So the old issue in 2015 was more uh, when the brokers are capturing expenses, so declared living expenses, they're capturing it in toolbox and they're sort of breaking it up into components and it might be travel, entertainment, groceries. And so they do that once. When it goes into Apply Online, Apply Online is effectively preparing an application for any of the 22 lenders that are on our panel. All those lenders have different categories for how they like expenses to come in. So where some might want groceries and electricity bills, others group that together. And so it becomes an issue when it gets to Apply Online and brokers need to go in and then change the components of those expenses, not the overall expenses, but the breakup. And so the issue back in 2015 was around that anomaly, which exists um, and is a challenge with between the two systems I now. See. So this issue about capturing dependence was not picked up in 2015? No, it wasn't, but it's a, yeah, it was picked up in 2017 uh, and it relates to 2013, actually, the issue. It's important, isn't it, the number of dependents? It is, it's a, it's a good pick up, absolutely. Now, why is it important? So. Do you want me to talk through the issue? Well, it's an important aspect of assessment of suitability, is it not? Because the cost of a dependent means a person has less money to finance a loan. Absolutely. And if you default to a HEM, an HEM, which HEM you enter depends on the number of dependents, doesn't it? That's correct. So if you've got the wrong number of dependents uh, recorded, uh, an HEM may be uh, uh, taken to account in assessing uh, serviceability which is inapposite. That's correct. It may be understated. That's right. The modest living standard recorded by HEM for a couple, uh, surprise, surprise, is less than the modest living standard for a couple plus two dependent children. That's correct. Yeah. So it's possible that where this happened, Mr Body, that the loan suitability was not properly assessed, and in fact the loan may have been unsuitable for the customer. Is that possible? At the end it's possible, if I walk through it, so Aussie, we're required to do a serviceability calculation and we do that in toolbox, so the correct dependents are in toolbox and we run a serviceability calculation for every application. So we do that and we did a serviceability calc on all these uh, and we've analysed them all and we've conducted that and they pass their serviceability. Uh, but then we pass the information into apply and line and this is where the issue becomes and apply and line then goes to the lenders. And there was a glitch in the system, so a system issue when a change occurred, which meant that when dependent information was being input into toolbox, if I put down that you have two children but don't put the age of the children or the date of birth, then it was wiping out the dependents in apply online. So the lenders were receiving an electronic feed saying 
that application has no dependence on it. So Aussie did the serviceability calculation with two children on it. And that serviceability calculation was correct. It then went to the lender and they potentially, they have the electronic version without the dependence on it. Correct. Yes. That's right. But uh, the you must have, or Aussie must have agreements with these lenders to provide accurate information. Yes, contractual agreements, yes. So it has breached those agreements. So we've been through and analysed the files. So these numbers were early numbers that the auditors picked up. So in terms of the files impacted. Uh, what do you mean early numbers, Mr Boddy? What do you mean early numbers? So this is while they're con conducting the audit. So this is their high level assessment of the potential loans impacted. Uh, and that was during the period in November 2017. What we did is then went through every file. So we can the number, isn't it, Mr. Body? 8,471. Right. So the correct number is 2,657 settled loans where dependent information was not electronically sent to lenders. So 2,657, so that's a lot, yes. Uh, we've been through those files, 64% of those files. The brokers, so we've done an Aussie serviceability cap, but the brokers have done manual lender serviceability calculations on manual forms. We just can't tell if they've been submitted in paper copy to the lenders. Where do I find this number of 2675 you've just quoted? Uh, it won't be in the internal audit report. It's through internal investigations in the business. And so we've reported it to ASIC as good governance reporting, that number, uh, and we've also notified the lenders. Did you tell ASIC that the auditors had found different numbers? N we didn't talk about the 8,000 number, no. We talked about identified settled no loans with incorrect dependent information. Yes, I see. And has this error, this flow-through error, been corrected now? Yes, it was corrected within two days of the audit team identifying it. It was a, it was a technical IT um, issue, a change that occurred, and appropriate testing hadn't been carried out, and so the glitch was in there, and so it was remediated immediately. Uh, we've notified ASIC, and we've also notified the lenders. Do you know the outcomes of any loan reviews performed in relation to those loans? We'll stay in contact with the lenders on those. So we ran our serviceability on, on the 65% or sorry, 64% of those files that we've reviewed the manual serviceability calculations which were carried out for each of the lenders by our brokers. They passed the serviceability calc on that. Um, but there's exposure there. And so each of the lenders will review those files. And, uh, and, if, and I assume if there's a concern, they will notify us. Okay. There's also another heading further down on the 0015 page, which is page two, risk management activities and capabilities are not sufficient to provide sufficient cover over AHL business processes. Whilst AHL has invested in risk management capabilities since our last audit, this has not been in keeping with the increase in regulator and community expectations. Now, what is the departure from expectations there, Mr Body, that's happened? So the feedback there we've taken on board and we've got a program of work looking at that. We're looking at investing well, more heavily. Once you were done, you were asked what the... Uh, uh, departures? Departures were. What were the departures? Sorry, what do you mean by the departures? How, how was it not in keeping with the increase in regulator and community expectations? Is it just the investment amount or was there other aspects to that? The capabilities? I think it's, it's an audit opinion. Uh, the, Compliance and the risk team have grown in over that period of time from I think it was three or four people to over 15 people, so it has been growing. I think regulatory focus has, has increased during that period, uh, and it's an opinion that we haven't kept up with that. We're looking at investing more heavily in our line one and line two risk. We're taking this on note and, and doing it. Okay, well, I'll take you to Appendix A of that document, which sets out some very high to medium audit issues. That's 0020. You'll see the first, this is the, the one we've just been discussing, I think, the controls about declared information. That's correct. And that has an issue date. I sh is that the issue date when it's meant to be actioned by? In the penultimate column? Yes, that's correct. That issue date is, is, is that a typo there? 30 of September 2019? 
Look, the completion date is a lot earlier than that. So that's uh, at the beginning of the, as the, sorry, the close of the audit. Uh, and at that stage, people try to predict how long it's going to take to close the issue. Um, the target that we have internally is a lot shorter than that. So the first item there is the, the capturing the customer dependence date of birth. So that's the de dependence yes. dependence. That was the dependent information. So that was corrected in November. I see. 2017. Um, complete the investigations of the findings. So that, that has been completed. It says by 30 April that's been completed, and we notified. Uh, ASIC and the lenders last Wednesday, which I think was the 7th of March. Um, it's the investigating the new control that we we're putting in place. We've got that in pilot, and this is a reconciliation of the two systems. So the declared information that's going into toolbox and apply online and, and applying a reconciliation that sits across those two systems. That's the challenging piece. That's the piece we're focused on doing at the moment. The expectation is that would be completed by, I think the target date is September 2018. And the next set of issues and actions is under the umbrella. Some key responsible lending requirements have not been met. And we see that the date due for that is, again, 30 March 2019. Surely you'd want to fix that issue earlier than that, Mr. Mr. Body, would you That's agree? right. Sorry, so point one there is the responsible lending policy, which the recommendation is to put that in place. And we've put that in place. We did that in early March of this year. Uh, and then the other one we're looking at is enhancing toolbox uh, to put in new fields that'll make it easier for brokers to comply. So new fields around requirements and objectives when there's an interest only loan or around investor loans uh, and items like that. We're looking at putting patches and builds into toolbox to make sure it's easy to capture that information for the broker. What about the last one, monitoring controls associated with to key responsible lending requirements? through RCSA CAP testing. What, what's that, R RCSA CAP testing? These are risk and control self-assessments. So throughout 2016 and 2017, the business focused on assessing risk and processes across their, their business units. And so once you have done that, we've, uh, we've completed that review. We've identified what the risks and the controls are in place. Um, and some controls are missing. We're going to be putting those in place. And then CAP is the CAP testing. So it's control assurance program. So once you identify your processes, you identify the controls, you then have to have a testing regime that you do on a quarterly or monthly basis, dependent on the process that you're testing. And the recommendation is that we could be doing more testing on our control self-assessments. And there are a number of other uh, issues there that have a high rating. Just before you depart from that, second category. You say that the responsible lending policy has now been uh, created yes. in March of this year? That's correct. How big a document is that? I think from memory five pages. We will come to it, Mr Body, okay. if that assists. Yes. Okay, well, I think that's all I wanted to go to on document C, uh, C1, the group order and assurance report. I'll tend to that document, Commissioner. Uh, will be Exhibit 1.74. It is uh, a Group Audit and Assurance Internal Audit Report, CBA 0506 0001 0014, uh, 11 December uh, 17. Um, Mr Body, you're aware that that document was one of two that was attached to a, an audit committee report that went to CBA. So that one's marked C1. There was another one marked C2. Are you aware of that? The two reports that I remember going to the uh, CBA risk and or the audit committee uh, was the audit report as well as the culture survey, the 2017 risk culture survey. Okay, well, we'll go to the culture survey, Mr Body. That's CBA 0506. 0001-0038. So that's dated November 2017. And you uh, mentioned on the first page, is that because you prepared this document, Mr Body, or you're accountable? No, that was prepared by the CBA Group Assurance Team, so an independent team. They, run the, they ran the survey independently. Uh, I think they compiled the report in November 2017. I received it in January 2018, and is so when they gave it to me. 
I see. What, why is your name on the front of is it? Because I'm the responsible executive for the audit, so I'm their relationship point for the audit. So when they're planning, timing the audit, findings of the audit and reporting them back to myself and the executive team of Aussie, they do it all through me. So but that's why it's addressed to me and then I distribute it to the executive team. You're familiar with the contents of this document? Oh, yes, yes. Okay. On the second page, which is 0039, let's take a look at that. Um, do you want to just explain to us firstly what, what you understand risk culture to mean? What is that in lay terms? Uh, risk culture is across our organisation. We have 280 people approximately. Um, what's their awareness of risk? What are their, is their awareness of the processes we have in place? What are those processes in place for? Um, are they working effectively? And are they mitigating the risk and reducing the business, our brokers being exposed to potential financial loss or reputational impact? There's a few comment boxes there. At the top it says, during October 2017, all Aussie Home Loan staff were invited to complete a risk culture survey. 131 staff participated in the assessment and 64 staff gave written comment. By staff, does that include brokers? It doesn't include brokers. It doesn't, no. okay. There's, there's one comment there in the centre saying that they've found substantial improvement but as well as areas of concerning behaviour that need to be addressed. Um, the box to the right there, number six, says 52% of participants agree that sometimes they need to bend the rules to get things done. Some say they were poor at following implemented procedures. Causes of this may be lengthy processes that cause inconvenience to a customer, where a shortcut will work just as well, but isn't the official process pressure from other staff members for something urgent and broker satisfaction and broker pressure to achieve sales. Now, the reference to bending the rules, do you think that staff think that the Credit Act or the credit legislation are rules that, are, that can be bent or to get things done? Is that one of those rules? I mean, my interpretation of that, and the, so one is the concern that people are cutting corners. And so, you know, as an executive team, we're keen to understand why people feel the need to cut corners. The other one is then, what's the risk or what's the exposure of that? Are they cutting corners because it's an inefficient process? If that is, it's a great idea, let's do something about it and make it more efficient. Um, but if they're cutting the corner on a formal standard operating procedure that we have, uh, that's been set out that way, that'll expose the business as a potential risk of loss. So uh, we need to be able to track that and report that. So I think there's two interesting findings coming out of that. And what about the pressure to achieve sales? Sales here, does that refer to home loan applications submitted on behalf of a customer? Look, I all I can do is interpret the, the people that made that response. I think there would be no doubt when a broker has a customer at their door uh, and they're trying to process an application and the customer wants to settle the house next weekend because it's going to auction and it's urgent, that they're ringing Aussie head office and saying, why can't you help me get this application through to the lender so I can get it approved and get the house settled? I think, um, I think that pressure exists. Uh, I don't think that's um, potentially an issue. That's just more around the feedback from employees because it's an employee survey is that they feel that they're under pressure by brokers, but I think Brokers are trying to help the customer settle the home as quickly as possible. So that's the way I interpret it, and I see some of that pressure exist in the business. And is it something that management is encouraging, that this speed, they're, they're telling staff, look, we want these things done quickly, we want customers to be happy, so push them through as quickly as you can? There's definitely a driver to make sure the customer's happy. Uh, there's also an op opportunity just to make the process a hell of a lot easier, I think, or more efficient, sorry. Okay, there's another box there. Seven, staff believe favouritism exists when applying consequence management. Only 47% of staff agree that incentive structures encourage appropriate risk taking, and only 60% that appropriate consequences are applied for non-compliance with procedures. Currently, there appears to be leniency across different teams, and particularly across brokers. High performing brokers are protected. When not complying or a breach occurs, action needs to take place so others in the network understand we take our risk rules seriously. It is possible that high levels of neutral voting reflect this inconsistency. But what does it mean to say, the person's comment there, high performing brokers are protected? What's that a reference to? 
I'm not sure what that's a reference to. Uh, in terms of misconduct, I haven't seen anyone being given favouritism in terms of brokers. Uh, you know, it, it could be in terms of brokers have a lot of administration they need to do. They're running, they're independent contract contractors running their own businesses. They have insurance policies they need to renew on an annual basis. They have memberships they need to do. Uh, employees, Aussie staff members, have to remind them to um, renew their memberships on a regular basis. And I know there's frustrations when people haven't done it on a timely basis and then there's constant follow-up that's required for some brokers. That may be an interpretation as to why some of those brokers feel protected or the employees feel that they're protected, that they don't have to sort of renew their insurance policy in a timely matter. Um, but I haven't seen it in relation to misconduct at all. But the high-performing brokers, are they the ones that bring in uh, a higher percentage of commissions or higher volume of commissions compared with others? I would say it's probably a more successful broker. So a well-established business. What do you mean by more successful? Do you mean more, more loan applications brought in? I would say the customer, or oh, sorry, the, the broker has a larger customer base. And on page 0041, we see some comparisons with CBA's organisation as a whole. See there, the top, so the top line compares some of the better items where Aussies performed better than the CBA group as a whole, but the bottom line is the worst items. So our tools and systems allow us to manage risk effectively and people have generally answered below the norm on, on, in the CBA group. Other, thing, other items like that are appropriate consequences are applied consistently for non, consistently for non-compliance with procedures. Item six, I'm told how risk management helps us meet the needs of customers. And item 11, sometimes we bend the rules to get things done. So we're seeing a trend, aren't we, Mr Body? People are taking shortcuts and bending the rules. You, you, observe, you observe that yourself? Uh, no, I haven't observed people cutting corners and cutting rules. Um, why why can... is it do you think that people are answering these questions? That, that's, that's their impression. Oh. My comment on the trend, so I mean there was a comment on the first page about the trend that um, it did a, a comparison to the 2016 uh, culture survey, so the, the, the comparison was that 2016 culture survey was well below CBA standards, well below CBA standards. Um, the 2017 is on par with CBA culture survey. Um, I mean the first item you mentioned there, item 15, which is our tools and our systems um, aren't effective to manage risk or aren't as effective to manage risk, being lower than the CBAs, which is high, highly advanced in terms of technology the CBA is. I, you know, I think that's probably a reflective comment of some of the systems we have in Aussie, both from our staff members and our brokers, that they could be more efficient and they could be lifted. I think that's probably a, a fair difference between the CBA and Aussie home loans. Okay. And what about over the page we go to 0044? Here are some voting results on the organisation as a whole. And the survey response is, is colour coded, so where we, we've got green, it's it's a very positive response to the question. Um, so affirming the question, if I could put it that way. And there's a there's a couple down there along the left that I want to ask you about. Um, one is unethical behaviour exists in my area. We've got quite a strong response across there. What what do you have to say about that? Sorry, which question was the that? Question unethical, five? Question 17. Unethical oh. behaviour exists in my area. Sorry, that's just not on the screen. Oh. Sorry, Mr Boy. There it is. Sorry, I don't have a. Yeah, I'm, just, I'm familiar with the report, but that question it just doesn't doesn't make sense. It's not indicative. You don't think it's reflective of what's occurring at Aussie? Do you don't think that, that there's any evidence of that? You don't see that? No, I don't. Is that the 2017 report? It is from November 2017. As I read it, it's 85% of respondents saying that. Yes, unethical response, uh, unethical behaviour exists in my area, and yeah, my eyebrows 
shoot through the forehead uh, at that response, but am I misreading it? I feel I'm misreading it because the sort of the, the table in the bottom, green means very positive, so like green indicates good scores, red indicates bad scores. Um, there's a lot of green on that bar, but the, the label attached to the question just doesn't seem to align with the colour coding coming through that it's so green, yet the comment's talking about unethical behaviour. And in the hands of the uninformed third party, it reads as though a huge majority of the organisation says yes, there's unethical behaviour. Now that, I would have thought, would be attracting more red flags than you could uh, uh, yeah. find in certain squares on certain days. Yeah. So I, it looks wrong to me, I and mean, it wasn't even a call out on the front page. It, it, it looks like the information's incorrect. Yeah. It wasn't a call out in the, in terms of the development areas on the front page of the 2017 report, unethical behaviour wasn't a call out, there was a minor call out about favouritism to brokers, but there's no sort of call out around that, so that looks like that question is mislabeled. The question is mislabeled, or do you think people have answered incorrectly? I think potentially the report is incorrect, that, that label on it. That's Let's assume it to be so, and assume that 85% are in effect saying, no, look, there's no unethical behaviour in my area. If, if that's the proper construction of it, that's right. we're still left with about 15% uh, giving uh, neutral or negative responses, aren't we? Yes. What are to make of that? Not insignificant, I would have thought, 15 out of 100 employees think that there's unethical things happening in their work area. What about over the page, Mr. Body? There's some other results that maybe are a bit more straightforward. And 0045, don't think they can all contain that error. Um, the first one, raising an issue is more trouble than it's worth. And here people have answered positively. And we've seen reference to this earlier. Do, do, that's troubling, isn't it, that people think? That's a concern, absolutely. I think. It you know, in the environment we want them to raise those concerns and, and look at those processes and improve those processes. If these people have issues with processes, we're trying to fix them as quickly as possible. And I further think down, question 26 is similar. There is a reluctance to share bad news. And that's troubling as well, isn't it? That's consistency between these categories, the answers. It is. Uh, however, on the, f the front page, the summary of what was good and, and what needs to be developed, there was, a, there was a key call out around the transparent, open culture and that people felt comfortable escalating and raising issues. So I think that was a good take out. So I think if people have these issues, they feel comfortable raising those issues with the executive teams or with management. Can I come away from the particular numbers that we see in these bar charts and just... Uh look for a moment at questions of culture in an organisation more generally. Would you accept that culture in an organisation depends on what employees or members of the organisation think is rewarded? Yes. And so, for example, if you have a mythical organisation, a hypothetical organisation, where uh, employees are paid only according to the numbers of sales of widgets that they make. Uh, they, the values of the organisation will be driven by sales, won't they? Potentially, yes. Yeah. And another important element of culture of an organisation is um, the sense that those with grievances can raise them and have them dealt with fairly? Yes. Any other large contributors of the kind I've uh, just indicated that go, in your view, to making up the culture of an organisation? I think that ability to escalate issues and raise concerns is a key, is a key part of a, a culture. But a central element is what the employee thinks that the organisation values. Yes. And what the employee thinks the organisation values is often affected, even moulded, 
by what they see the organisation as rewarding. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. And that's why uh, questions of volume-based remuneration and issues of that kind are matters that at least are relevant to issues about the culture of an organisation. Yes. Yes. Now, when you came into Aussie, how would you describe the culture of the organisation as you came into it? So I'd say it's a, a very dynamic, fast, sort of growing culture. It's been a very successful business over time, and it still is. Uh, the brokers are extremely customer focused. That's their lifeline. The, uh, the independent contractors they are, so they're running small businesses, are purely focused on their customers and building their customer bases. So there's a, there's a passion around the customer, obviously. Um, in terms of risk and compliance, a developing culture. So definitely not a, a mature risk culture, but a developing risk culture that's, that's been moving forward and it's getting better each year and it's, uh, it's enhancing its processes. Sorry, Ms Diaz. I'll turn Friday to that. afternoon, I'm obviously uh, off the leash. I'll be quiet for a millisecond. Uh, I'll turn to the risk culture summary, Commissioner, from November 2017. Uh, that will be Exhibit 1.75, CBA 0506, 001, 0038, Risk Culture Survey, November 17. <coughs> now, Mr Body, that was the second document that was attached to the Group Audit and Assurance Report sent to the Audit Committee in February this year, 5th of February. I'll take you to that report just very briefly. It summarises what we've been speaking about. It's CBA 0506, 0001. Triple zero one. There's reductions in the bottom part, so it does look a bit strange, Mr. Body. I apologise, but that second part of the page has been redacted. Have you seen the, the, this document before? Uh, I have, yes. So the first at three point two, it mentions that red rated Aussie Home Loans audit, again rated red. Significant issues from our prior audit remain. New issues relating to information technology, security and compliance with responsible lending obligations, some of which require ASIC notification, could impact on AHL's reputation. Management are awaiting formal legal advice on whether an ASIC notification is required. Our findings stress the need for the group to strengthen its oversight of AHL and lift the risk culture at ASL, AHL. Now, that reference to ASIC notification, is that what you were referring to before? That's correct, the independent uh, issue that we did a good, we weren't required to legally to uh, notify ASIC, but we did a good, good governance notification to ASIC. When you say you weren't required to legally, are you saying you were told by a lawyer. Yeah, the advice was because Aussie's done the serviceability calculation, so we have the application, we carried out a serviceability calc as a credit assistant, a credit service provider, we've completed what we were supposed to do. However, contractually we've got an obligation to our lenders, so we notified them, but good governance just notified ASIC as well. Okay. And over the page, under retail banking services, There's a bit of a history about Aussie there and the follow-up audit being delayed. And it refers then at 4.23 to the toolbox and the failure to reconcile the toolbox and AOL, the system used by the lenders to make credit assessments. Despite this issue being closed by management, we found over 8,000 loan applications, of which 6,000 were funded, where dependent information was not sent from toolbox to AOL. So this is what we talked about before, but this is February now, and you mentioned some figures that were a lot lower. Why are they not the figures in here? Oh, the figures that are submitted in here are submitted by CBA Group Audit and Assurance, so they submit their numbers, and I don't, I don't get a say in what's submitted to the Board Audit Committee, so they do a separate independent submission and, and then present that. So 
I think that a key difference there is they're talking about 8,000 applications, whereas uh, based on our analysis, we went through to actual settled loans, so where a settlement had occurred, so that sort of then dropped it significantly. Let's see, and it, uh, the, over the page at 4.2.4, fundamental broker agency policy and procedures, have we got that? Yes. To ensure compliance with responsible lending obligations has al have also not been established. Without this, there is an increased risk of compliance issues in the AHL business. A quality assurance program in place that subjects each broker to just one file review per year on average requires strengthening to meet rising regulatory expectations. And we discussed this before and I mentioned that one file review. Yes. And you would admit that, that the committee is saying again here in February a few weeks ago that this is still not satisfactory to ensure that the responsible lending obligations are being complied with. Do you agree with that? I agree that we can do more in terms of the file reviews and we can do more in terms of controls around monitoring broker behaviour. And so that was those pieces of work that we're doing. So we talked about the, the, the number of file reviews um, and we sort of 3% as one of these streams, we're looking at adding more resources in line one. Uh, and so we're looking to double that, uh, the manual file review process. But in addition to that, we're also doing uh, or preparing the broker governance dashboard. So the broker behaviour dashboard, which is in pilot at the moment, it's being used, um, sort of tracking those metrics, patterns and monitoring behaviours of brokers and their applications is helping direct where we do these manual file reviews as well. In your statement, you, you say, at paragraph 22, that the broker monitoring dashboard will potentially prompt for review of a greater number of files for that particular broker. Uh, perhaps we can show you that. That's AHL.0008.0020.0001. And at paragraph 22 of the statement, you, you refer to the dashboard, or oh, 11, sorry. And Ms Harris today, I don't know if you heard her evidence, but she said it's in the pilot phase. And that's going yes. to... Sorry. Yes, and it's potentially going to allow you to prompt greater review of, of files. Yes. Um, how is it going to do, do that? How are you going to... So okay. we have access to it now, the executives, uh, and we're looking at it. Uh, and there's some of the, the risk and compliance team are looking at it as well. Uh, what we haven't done is rolled out across the business, so it's there. Uh, what it does for each broker, so it's a, a system called Power BI, it's sitting over our Aussie system, so toolbox and apply online, and it's pulling up information about every application a broker's doing. So it will look at things like the amount of, I think Linda mentioned, the amount of rework so as in an, a lender's coming back asking for more information about the application that was submitted. And it will show statistics on how many times that broker is getting asked for more information about file reviews. Uh, and it'll look at a number of metrics. I'll do number of file review, uh, sorry, number of requests for additional information around an application. Uh, LVRs greater than 80%. So what percentage of applications does broker A settle that are over that? Uh, investor uh, interest only loans that they're settling. Uh, Concentration risk as well, that was mentioned a little bit earlier about, you know, is 80% of their loans going to one lender? So it's not going to tell us there's an issue, but what it's going to do is indicate um, areas for us to zero in on. So if a broker has high concentration risk to one lender, well then some of those points, let's pull a number of their files and let's go through, let's check the documentation uh, and see why they're doing that. Have they got the objectives and the requirements of the customer right? Uh, is that why they're picking that? Um, and then let's pull the information. While we say it's in pilot, is we're looking at it, but we're learning. So there was a number of cases today that were talking about um, gift certificates uh, and letters of employment. We don't have it on there yet, but we should be adding those as metrics. We should be saying how many loans did broker A submit that had a gift certificate on it? And if the percentages are high, let's start looking at those files and the gift certificates are on there. And are they fraudulent or not? At the moment, it's not rolled out completely. So you're relying on file reviews of the one or three percent? Yeah, it's not rolled out, uh, but we definitely look at the information it's, and it's telling us stuff already. So uh, uh, and there was a point made earlier around um, 
brokers settling loans in two different states and the statistics were quite high that how can a broker settle loans in, in Queensland and New South Wales and as we drilled into those we found that the brokers living practically on the borderline uh, and so it's showing us information like that we're using it now but we haven't rolled it out to line one you're right line two aren't using it every day yet um, but we're we're using it we're learning from it and then we will roll it out but it's um it, it came out of the audit report it's a it's a good idea and we we're doing it uh, if I could go back. It's necessary for you to comply with your statutory obligations, isn't it? It's, yeah, it's another tool that's enhancing our opportunity to detect fraud uh, and other misconduct. Well, Absolutely. to comply with your obligations under the Credit Act uh, yes. about responsible lending and about running your business honestly, efficiently, etc. Yes. Is that right? You heard Ms Harris talk today about the compliance certificates that have to be produced every year and some of the categories in that certificate. Uh, and the Commission has referred to one of them. And there are, there are a number of categories that seem to be deficient. Would you agree with that in terms of uh, proving that you have adequate arrangements and systems in place to ensure that you do all things necessary that, to ensure that credit activities are engaged in efficiently, honestly and fairly? Uh, no, I don't agree with that. I think we have adequate systems in place. Are they the best systems and can they continue to improve? Yes. Do you, have, you don't have adequate systems in place to detect fraud, do you, Mr. Uh, Lee, the we do have process? processes in place to detect fraud, so we have the manual file reviews that are occurring, uh, both in line one and line two. Uh, will they detect every case of fraud? Fraud is extremely hard to identify. Uh, multiple group certificates from different companies but in the same font is very hard to detect, uh, so we won't get every case. But we have adequate systems to detect processes and issues uh, and pick them up and do something about it. But we, we won't get every case. So the four that we heard about this morning, uh, they're hard um, to detect and we're getting better at it. And, and what we do is we work also, we work closer with the lenders. So what can we learn from the lender and what can we share with the lender about a potential file or a broker or a, or a customer's file as well? At, at the moment, the full extent of the process, as I understand, is just the file review process. Is that right? of the uh, assurance process in terms of or broker detecting conduct? fraud. Of detecting fraud. I, I mean, there's a range of different things and I, I can go through them. I don't want to go into too much detail. But, you know, from the contractual obligations when a broker starts that they sign up to comply with NCCP. That's not going to detect fraud, is it, Mr Boddy? Uh, a contract? Sorry, prevent fraud, but sorry, yeah, detect. In terms of detect, it will be the file reviews that we're conducting. So we conduct file reviews at line one, line two. Uh, other things we do is so every customer uh, on their first appointment on settlement and a one year anniversary gets a email from Aussie requiring feedback on the broker and how they're performing as well. So if there's any suspected fraud, there's an opportunity for customers to can raise that as well. Um, so line one, line two and contacting the customer. You're relying on the customer to come back to you when they're themselves. It's another, them. it's another tool. Um, and then a third one would be all of the uh, brokers, Aussie brokers, complete needs analysis for their customers. So they capture all the information that's required in the NCC P Act, uh, and then they sit down with the customer and they go through that. They go through the objectives, they go through the income, the expenses that are declared, the assets and the liabilities, and then together, the customer signs off and makes a declaration there as well. I mean, that's another process to pick up that um, you know, false payslips aren't being provided false gift certificates aren't being provided. There's that conversation that's happening with the broker and the customer and they're going through that needs analysis. That's another it's preventative... It's the fraudulent broker, Mr Boddy. Is that, that's correct. It's the fraudulent broker, the broker that's actually engaging in misconduct, that you're relying on to have that conversation with the customer. Yeah, both. The fraudulent and the non-fraudulent brokers have that conversation and the customer's in that conversation, so there's an opportunity for the customer to say, that isn't my income, that isn't my pay slip and sign, I mean, there's declaration on there as well. It's just an, it's not foolproof, but we have the file reviews, we have the needs analysis, uh, we have a number of things. Well, the needs analysis is just telling me that if the system is operated properly by people giving honest information, you get an honest outcome. Is it any more than that, Mr Boddy? That's correct. If the customer's giving honest information and the broker's got the honest information, then it'll yeah. get the right outcome. Yes. We're talking about detecting the case where someone in the process is less than honest. That's right. So Telling me that the system, if it works perfectly, works perfectly, doesn't seem to advance matters terribly far. Yes. What I'm fussed about is there seem to have been events yes. of misconduct. 
What is there now to prevent these things happening again? So now we have the broker monitoring dashboard. So in addition to the line two and line one file reviews. Commissioner, I think I'll tender that group audit and assurance report. Uh, exhibit 1.76, CBA audit committee report, paper number 12, 5 February 2018. Before I leave it, I'm not sure if I referred to 4.2.5, but that also refers to the... Five oh six treble oh one treble oh one, which I should have included in the designation of the exhibit. And at triple zero three, there's reference to this issue with the AOL system access, allowing multiple users, including brokers, to make direct changes to applications without detection, increasing the risk that a loan can be manipulated at a later stage to obtain funding approval. We further found loan applications where contact details were either the broker's mobile phone number, 464 loans, or email address, 1,645 loans, instead of the customer's details, further increasing the potential for fraud. Has that been fixed? That's a problem, isn't it? You're saying pe people are going, the customers are going to be contacting and having that, that contact, but they're not even the people that are being listed in the loans. Yeah. That hasn't been fixed. That, that's a challenge I mentioned a little bit earlier around toolbox in terms of, say, capturing the expenses that they capture the components, but then when it goes to apply online, depending on the lender, you need to manually change the expense categories. So apply online, will, apply online will send the application to a different lender. So CBA, Westpac and Macquarie have different categorisations of their expenses. And so a broker needs to go into apply online to change those components. Um, Has it been fixed for the 464 loans? or what, 1,600 plus loans referred to here? Uh, it hasn't been fixed, but uh, communications rolled out and policies rolled out about not putting broker information, their own contact details, in those apply online systems. That's telling them to follow the form, but what's, what's been done to check that they're following the form? Well, as part of the file review process, there is a comparison of toolbox to apply online and they will go through all this information and, and that gets detected in our reporting that we do. Will the broker dashboard pick this up as well? Oh, this is around customers having, in apply online having broker contact details. No, it won't pick this up. We spoke earlier about culture and rewards. Does Aussie do anything to reward uh, people uh, for meeting responsible lending requirements? So the, the people that are obliged to meet the responsible lending requirements are independent contractors, the brokers. So if they don't, they're contractually obliged to meet responsible lending requirements and follow the NCCP Act and Regulatory Guidance 209. And if they don't, uh, then we can review and we can terminate the contract with them. And Aussie has its own obligations under the NCCP Act, True. does it not? Yes. Yep. It has to ensure that its credit representatives obey the law. That's right. Yes. Does Aussie do anything to reward anyone for obeying the law? I'm not sure. I think the answer is no, Mr no. Body. Yeah. And unless you point out to me yeah, I'm not what aware I'm of any. missing, I think the answer is no. No. Yeah, do go on. The last paragraph there that's unredacted is 4.2.7. CBA has had executives involved in AHL as directors in recent years and has gradually been placing senior lenders in the business to achieve greater alignment with the bank's practices. However, in our view, this requires further enhancement to ensure consistency of governance and leadership with respect to risk and controls. In short, AHL's risk culture needs to lift. That reference to placing directors and senior lenders in the business, is that a reference to people such as yourself? Are you one of those people? I may be seen to be one of those people. I'm not too sure if that's what they're referring to. There's, there's other CBA people who are involved in being directors in the past from different parts of the CBA. the document I think I want to, there's two documents I'll take you to Mr Body before we finish up. The responsible lending policy 
Uh, I'll just I'll tender it. It's all, I think it's an att attachment to Ms. Harris's statement and exhibit to the, that, but I'll I'll tender it nonetheless. Sorry, to whose? Uh, it's an attachment to which? Uh, well, I'll, I'll call out the ID number, I think, Commissioner. Yes, it's see. AHL.0009.0002.0039. Yes. And that policy, see from the first page, perhaps the first two pages can be put on the screen. So that came into effect two March, nearly weeks ago. Uh, and on page four, we see that the purpose of the policy is to describe the procedures that Aussie has put in place to ensure compliance with its responsible lending obligations under the NCCP laws, including the requirements set out in Regulatory Guide 209, Credit Licensing Responsible Lending Conduct. So be before this document, a few weeks ago, that came into effect, you didn't have anything that described procedures that you had in place to ensure compliance with responding to responsible lending obligations. Is that correct? Uh, we had, this uh, for our brokers, we had uh, training requirements, contractual arrangements where, when they're signing up to be an Aussie broker to comply with NCCP and the Regulatory and the Responsible Lending Act. We didn't have a formal document called the Responsible Lending Policy and this came out of the audit and that's why we put it in place, to further clarify the requirements to meet responsible lending. Tender the policy, Commissioner. Exhibit 1.77, AHL 0009, 0002, 0030, AHL Responsible Lending Policy. How long's the document? Uh, it extends all the way to page 0041, Commissioner, I believe. 12 pages. Uh. Yes. Yeah, we perhaps put up uh, two pages at a time. Looked at most documents, but this is one that slipped me by. Have a look at it. Yes, so we've got a table of contents, context, purpose, scope, definitions, yes. Go over a page. In effect, the executive summary in four, five, What's to be done in the preliminary assessment? Yes. Now, perhaps unsurprisingly, it's not an especially prescriptive document. It is cast in terms of the objective is to verify this, verify that, and examples are given rather than uh, a list of prescriptive, thou shalt uh, do this, this, or this. Is that yes. right? That's right. Yes, that's pages seven and eight, then can I look at nine and ten? And then we've got 11 and 12, haven't we? Yes. On Thank page you. 11, there's a clause there about supervision and compliance. Clause <coughs> 8, Mr. Body. Uh, 8.1, Aussie's responsible managers are responsible for the supervision of Aussie representatives and compliance with this policy. The responsible managers will ensure that regular audits and spot checks are conducted to test compliance. Is that new? Is that something that's just started taking place now? These spot checks and regular audits? Well, the spot checks, are, it's a form of the file checks, the file reviews that we're doing. So regular um, or routine as well as targeted file reviews. It's doing. what you were discussing before. Yes. So it's not a, an improvement on that. It's just uh, the same that's thing. That's right. Okay. Okay. It's just that it will be linked to the, the broker dashboarding. Well, the last thing I wanted to ask you about is a document that was shown to uh, one of CBA's witnesses yesterday. It's uh, CBA.0001.0038.0929. So that's a letter dated nine, 10 February 2017 from Mr. Narev, then CEO of 
CBA to Mr Stephen Sedgwick, the independent reviewer of the Retail Banking Remuneration Review. Have you ever seen this before, Mr Body? No. This is Exhibit 1.37, yes. We can see from the first line it's written on behalf of Commonwealth Bank of Australia Group. Uh, now, at this stage, I understand that Aussie wasn't wholly owned by CBAs. This is February. No, no. yeah, that was in but, August, August 2017. But 80%. So it will be representative of Aussie's views this paper, not, do you think? I'm not sure about that. Okay, well, we'll go through it. Um, again, the group purported to speak for the uh, subsidiaries, did it, Mr. Body? It may have, yes. It did. Mm. We go to page 0930, or both can be shown up, I can see it, they are. Um, there's a mention of paragraph three, which we have referred to in the hearings, the need for greater consistency in mortgage sales remuneration. We agree with the reviewer's observations that while brokers provide a service that many potential mortgagees value, the use of loan size linked with upfront and trailing commissions for third parties can potentially lead to poor customer outcomes. Mortgages also sit outside the financial advice framework. Even though buying a home and taking out a mortgage is one of the most important financial decisions an Australian consumer will make. We would support elevated controls and measures on incentives related to mortgages that are consistent with their importance and the nature of the guidance that is provided. For example, the delinking of incentives from the value of the loan across the industry and the potential extension of regulations, such as Future of Financial Advice, FOFA, to mortgages in retail banking. There's a number of things that are mentioned here. I wanted to see if you agree with all of these statements. Uh, well, you would agree that buying a home and taking out a mortgage is one of the most important financial decisions an Australian consumer will make. Do you agree with that statement? Yes, it's a pretty big decision. And would you agree with the statement we would support elevated controls and measures on incentives? that are consistent with their importance and nature of the guidance that's provided by brokers? M me personally? Was well, that you in your role as a director of, of Aussie. Of Aussie. And its CO CFO. Look, I think if this is getting to trail, in terms of trail and should trail, if, if that's the question, is that the question? Yeah. Well, do you agree with the proposition that there need to be controls on how incentives are linked to the guidance that's being provided by or the job that's being provided by the, the mortgage broker in this in this in in the taking out of a loan? Uh, controls, yes, yeah, I think there should be controls. What about the delinking of incentives from the value of the loan across the industry? I think that's something that it could have multiple effects, and so it's something, something that would need to be considered. That's uh, sitting pretty firmly on the fence, uh, Mr. Body, if that's where you want to remain. Uh, but is it around try? So I can talk further around. Well, we can turn to the specific page that details some of the uh, the practices or the suggestions. We'll go to page yes. fourteen. which is uh, 0944. So this paragraph was also looked at it yesterday. Is there sufficient evidence to support a case for banks discontinuing the practice of volume-based commissions to third parties, and I interpolate there to say brokers, in respect of new and increased mortgages? As the review identifies, the use of upfront and trailing commissions linked to volume can potentially lead to poor customer outcomes. I'll stop there. Do, do you agree with that, Mr Body, with that statement there? That Mr Munarev is putting in to, to Mr Sedgwick, do you agree with that? It may potentially lead to poor outcomes. Our analysis of loans applied for through the proprietary versus broker channel shows that, one, broker loans are reliably associated with higher leverage. This finding is robust after allowing for all major descriptors of borrower circumstances, not only channel, but first home buyer status, owner-occupied status, fixed or variable loan choice, 
and major demographic factors of location, age and income. That, that first sentence there, do you agree with that? Broker loans are reliably associated with the higher leverage. Uh, I, I don't believe so, not in Aussie's case. I haven't looked at the industry. What about the second proposition? Even for customers with an identical estimate of ex-ante risks, loans through the broker channel have higher leverage. Same answer again, Mr Body, that you don't agree with that for Aussie. Yeah, I don't see higher leverage in, in the Aussie portfolio. Are you aware across the industry? You referred to, in some of the reports, uh, other aggregators research in that area. Do you know about Not that? about, there's no, the, I don't see the reporting on other aggregators in terms of, of their exposure, no. And the third bullet point, loans written through the broker channel have a higher incidence of interest only repayments, meaning customers pay down their loans more slowly. Broker loans have higher total debt to income levels, higher loan to value ratios and higher incurred interest costs compared to the proprietary channel. Are you able to speak about whether that, that's something that's, that you've seen and observed? Do you agree with that statement? Not in Aussie's case. So I don't see higher loans going to interest only in Aussie's case, and we've kind of got the broker tool there to start monitoring and, and keeping an eye on it, uh, but I don't see that. That may be mortgage broking industry impact, but not at Aussie. Well, Aussie submits Mr a Narev here was talking about uh, CBA's uh, experience, I think, in distinguishing between the proprietary channel and the broker channel. He's saying Aussie stood apart from the balance of the broker channel, eh? I'm not sure, unless it's the CBA view of all the third party brokering that they're seeing. I don't see that, though. I, in no, Aussie, I'm not aware of that information. And the last statement there, over time, higher leverage means broker customers have an increased likelihood of falling into arrears, pay down their loans more slowly, and on average pay more in interest than proprietary customers. Or would you say Look, that that's damning? Do you I'd agree say across that? our portfolio, I'd say most banks' arrears rates are around the 1% mark. Ours is uh, probably on average in line with that. Our arrears rates, I don't see it being higher than a banking arrears rate. Are you familiar with the fact that I think, I think it is ASIC has done some work which would uh, point in the same general directions as uh, uh, are recorded here? Yes. So Aussie is an outlier, you were saying? I'm just talking about our arrears rate. Our arrears rate is running around the 1% mark, so that's in line with banks. Uh, further down, there's a suggestion about a move to flat fee payments. And Mr Nurev says there in the penultimate bullet point, a move to a flat fee payment would enable brokers to be more agnostic toward loan size and leverage. However, consideration is needed on the payment amount, on how to link the fixed payment to an underlying security rather than a product. Do you, would you agree, Mr Body, that uh, it, it is desirable to move to a flat fee broker remuneration if upfront and trailing commissions are driving poorer customer outcomes, which you agreed was something I, that... I think you need to be careful making the move. Aussie's view is that trail um, or moving to a flat fee, one would impact the customer. So it would make affordability of seeing a mortgage broker uh, challenging for some people. So. I think that the current structure being a trail, the customer's not paying. Uh, other things around the trail that Aussie sees and... Sorry, the customer's not paying? In this case, are moving to a flat fee. For the fee. trail? I'm well, not the too sure who's not paying. not paying for it. Well, who's paying for the flat fee there? Well, and who's paying for the, the trail? It's, it's defrayed, is it not, Mr Body? All the customers pay for all... The, the bank is not paying it and not passing it on, it's being paid by the customer base, is it not? Right, I haven't read that whole document, but if, so assuming the, the lender's paying for the flat fee, then it's so, so it doesn't impact the customer then, if that's the assumption that, that I'll make The lender's that. not paying for it out of its own pocket and out of the goodness of its heart. It's going to recover the cost somewhere, isn't it, uh, Mr Body? The notion that a trail commission doesn't ultimately impact on the customer is a, a rather large proposition, isn't it? Yes, well... I'm not, I haven't read the whole document, so at what point does the, the fee get paid? So if you think about a customer's journey, they, you know, there's 20, 30 somethings who are coming for the first meeting to talk about the savings plan with a mortgage broker. I'm not too sure if they're paying a fee at that point. Um, and then when they're ready to purchase and they've saved enough, they start talking about getting uh, pre-approval before they find the house they want. And I'm not too sure if you're paying the fee at that point, um, which is where Trail supports the customer the whole way through the, the mortgage broking um, or the, the home loan uh, journey. 
I'm not too sure at what stage the fee is being recommended to be charged at that point. Uh, and then there's the ongoing maintenance of the loan and talking about the interest rates in two years' time, three years' time, the health of the loan as well. But the commissions that are being paid by customers, or yes. I apologise, I withdraw that, the commissions that are being paid by lenders to brokers are passed on to the borrowers. The banks pass those costs on. They are costs that are passed on. Right. They're costs that are incurred by the bank and then the bank, the bank would make pricing decisions and they'd either in incorporate those costs and those pricing decisions. And what services provided by the mortgage broker over the life of a 30-year loan that would justify trailing commissions across the life of the 30-year loan? Right. There's a, there's a lot of things that are happening along that journey with the mortgage broker from that first meeting they're having, which you know might be just a discussion around you don't have enough savings to apply for a home loan, you need to take two years saving and they'll start the conversation. The journey will start there, they'll then come back some time later or someone may be ready to have a, acquire a home now and they'll look for pre-approval, they haven't found the exact house and so the mortgage broker will spend time with them uh, seeking the pre-approval so they can purchase a house when it comes through. They may not purchase a house, they may not get a home loan. Uh, then there's the settlement, when they find a house, they buy the house and they need to settle the home loan. Uh, and then the continuing journey every year, any, every anniversary, is a discussion around the health of that loan. So are they happy with the interest rate? Do they need to split the, the loan into fixed and variable? Um, how, are they now married? Do they need to add someone else to the loan? Uh, all that administrative work the brokers are doing over the life of the journey, over the home loan. So a phone call once a year, do you think, going forward for 30 years, justifies the trailing commission? Uh, I think it depends on what those conversations are. I think you look back in the last couple of years, the interest rates have been coming down and then there's been a lot of conversations by Aussie brokers with customers about maybe now's the time to look at your loan, look at the interest rate you're, you have uh, and challenge that with your existing lender or potentially another lender. But some customers won't change their loan. They'll be perfectly happy to say, look, I don't need anything from you, Mr Broker. Goodbye, thanks. That's correct, they may. But the commissions are still being paid. That's right, they are. Uh, so there's the supporting of the loan over the journey. Uh, then there's the other view, which is the, the mortgage broker view. So they're independent contractors. They're running small businesses. Uh, and so as part of running a small business, if it's a retail store, they've got a store, they've got rent, they've got electricity. Uh, and that outlay of time and effort at the beginning before they settle the loan and the ongoing support, I mean, the trail supports that small business with their cash flow as well. So I think there's sort of that, that lender, that mortgage broker lens on, uh, on the trail. Does the bottom line you see no occasion to change uh, uh, the current remuneration of brokers? Uh, Aussie's view is no. Uh, no further questions of that witness, uh, Commissioner. Yes. I think I have to tender that. Uh, it's already, it's already in its exhibit 1.37. That, exactly right. Yes, thank you, Mr. Thank you. Yes. Does any party other than uh, who has leave to appear uh, seek leave to cross examine Mr. Body? No? Ms. Hogan Dora. Mr. Body, you asked some questions uh, at transcript 4112 by the Commissioner as to your and his interpretation of the results of the risk culture survey. Could the witness be shown CBA.0506.001.0038 And if you could just go to the, across the three pages, and the next, to the question 17. I'm sorry, I haven't got the internal reference. Thank you. Thank you, just pausing there. Yes. So it's zero zero, so dot zero zero four four, question 17, you're asked to question by the Commissioner concerning that. Could I have you go back to, could the witness be shown 0039? Now the Commissioner put to you, Mr Body, that as he read it, 85% of respondents thought that unethical behaviour existed in my area. Could I have you look at the first box and the heading? Yes. There is support for ethical and fair behaviour. Very few staff, 13%, believe that unethical behaviour exists within Aussie, question 17. And only 11% felt that policy and procedures are unfair to the customer, question 18. 
Does that accord with your understanding of the risk culture survey that's, result? That's correct. Whereas that other question looked incorrect. Right, thank you. And what is incorrect in the reporting perhaps is the colour coding or the absence of indicating how to interpret Whether the, the survey response. Were out. Yes. You were also asked some questions at transcript 420 by the Commissioner as to what does Aussie do, or does Aussie do anything to reward uh, compliance with responsible lending requirements? Aussie has, um, you've given some evidence about having mobile business lenders and uh, retail business consultants. They're employees of Aussie? Yes. yes. And are you aware of those, um, those employees being rewarded in relation to the efforts that they take in monitoring and supervising the respective franchisees or mobile brokers under their um, supervision? Yes. And what are they? They get rewarded for supporting and monitoring those brokers. Right. And, Good job. And are you aware of them being paid any uh, bonuses in respect of the undertaking of particular aspects of their role? Uh, I'm not, no. You yourself can't assist that, but somebody else may be able to? Yes, Linda would be able to. All right, thank you. Uh, exhibit 1.41 is Ms Harris's statement. And I just provide that as a reference to you, Commissioner. Yes. Are you aware that there are penalties imposed by um, Aussie on its mobile brokers for failing to comply with particular requirements? Yes. Uh, and are you able to assist the Commissioner by identifying uh, one, an example of one of those penalties? Uh, penalties they may incur would be um, they might get a breach notice, um, if there was a customer complaint and there was a compensation, they would be involved in paying part of that compensation or all of it as well. And in t one of the requirements of um, our Aussies brokers are to retain and upload into Toolbox particular documents. You're aware of that? Yes. And they are required to scan particular documents. You're aware of that? That's right. And are you aware of any penalties that Aussie imposes for failure to comply with those requirements? Uh, yes. So previously they would get uh, penalised in terms of trail commission. They'd have commission withheld and now they actually get turned off in terms of being able to write any loans until they get their scanning up to state. All right. And do you understand the intention of those penalties? Or what was the purpose of those penalties being posed by Aussie? Yes, it's a, it's a financial impact, so that they do something about it and get their scanning up to scratch as soon as possible. Right. In order to um, comply with the Act themselves? Yes. And to, compl and to en enable Aussie to comply with the Act? That's right. right. No additional questions. Thank you, Commissioner. Yes. Thank you very much. Yes, you may step down. Thank you very much, Mr Body. Thank you. Commissioner, I believe that completes the evidence for that case study. Um, did you want something? Okay. Apologies, I withdraw that. My learned leader has something else. They uh, never tell you anything, Ms Diaz. <laughs> <laughs> it's right in one sense, uh, Commissioner, in that there are no more witnesses being called to give evidence in this case study, but there is a further witness statement yes. that we wish to tender. And yes. that's a witness statement from Mr David Lee Smith, dated the 6th of March 2018, which is AHL 0011 0001. Yes. I tender the original statement. Exhibit 1.78, uh, statement David Lee Smith. 6 March 18, AHL 0011 0001 0001. Commissioner, um, that is a witness statement that Mr Smith signed on the 6th of March. It hasn't been verified. He is available, but if there's any, I don't understand there to be any issue. Well, if there's no challenge to it, uh, uh, I assume you don't want to challenge it, do you, Ms hogan -Dora? Not at all. No, didn't think so. I think it would be prudent, Commissioner, if I tender the summons that uh, Mr Smith received as well. Well, probably for his protection That's more right. than anything else, I That's would have right. thought. He is uh, present, and he, um, but I understand he's not required. That's right. Yes. Uh, exhibit 
uh, 1.79 will oh, be... I'm told it's in the folder, Commissioner. Well, it should be marked separately. Exhibit 1.79, summons to David Lee Smith. Yes. Uh, one other matter, uh, Commissioner, which is that I said incorrectly before that a document I referred to in the cross-examination of Ms Harris had been tendered and it had not. That was the CBA submission to you, Commissioner, uh, dated the 29th of January 2018, RCD 0001 0003 0004. Uh, I referred to two pages of that submission, pages 0034 and 0035, and I referred to paragraphs 170 to 177 on those pages. And it is those paragraphs on those pages that I will tender. Yes. Exhibit 1.80, paragraphs 170 to 177 of CBA submission. Uh, RCD treble zero one treble zero three double zero three four to double zero three five. Mission pleases. Uh, the next witness is Mr. Robert Regan. Mr. Robert Regan involves a different financial services entity represented by different councils. So, so do you want me to take a break a, while a everybody orders their papers? Um, I have a little after twenty-five past. If I come back at half past three. Thank you, Commissioner.